sliding filament theory or, or how muscle actually contracts with that excitation contraction coupling. You know, the uh, neuromuscular junction um, creates a signal that sweeps across the muscle cell, uh, which releases calcium and triggers contraction. So today we're going to continue to talk about how does the brain then control that mechanism to create the, the motion that we're after. You know, we don't, our, our muscles are not just on or off. They have a whole range of abilities. So um, at the end of last time, we talked about how muscle length um, plays a role in uh, how much uh, tension or, or force a muscle can generate. So uh, two other um, factors that play into that are the frequency of stimulation and then um, uh, the number of motor units that are involved. So in order to understand that first one, frequency of stimulation, we have to look at what happens in a very simple um, muscle scenario. So if the neuromuscular junction, if that motor neuron were to fire just one time, you know, and create one action potential that triggered contraction, what we would get is what's called a twitch. So in our picture here, you know, here's the stimulus. In other words, the neuromuscular junction um, uh, creates a, an action potential, but just one. So what we would see happen in the muscle is as calcium is released from that sarcoplasmic reticulum, we would see an increase in tension as those myosin heads start pulling on those actin molecules and, and pulling those sarcomeres together. But as that is occurring, if there's no further stimulus, that calcium that was released starts to get taken back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Once the calcium level around the myofibril starts to fall, we're going to see that the muscle is going to start to relax again. So in response to a single action potential, we'll have a contraction phase and then a relaxation phase, and then the muscle will be back to normal or back to its resting um, uh, state with all of the uh, active sites um, blocked by tropomyosin. So we call this a twitch, or the response of a muscle to a single action potential. Now, not all muscles are the same. So depending on the fiber type and the size of the muscle, twitch times, or, or the, uh, uh, the length of time it takes to develop a contraction and then a relaxation can really vary. So what we can see in this graph here is the eye muscles are all about speed. You know, they're about rapid, fast um, contraction to move the eyes around very rapidly. So in the eye muscles, we see a very rapid twitch. Um, so stimulus, contraction, relaxation, all in a very narrow time. Whereas uh, in the muscles of the calf, you know, the quadriceps, for example, or uh, rather the <coughs> gastrocnemius or the soleus muscle, which you'll learn about those later, the twitch is much slower. So from stimuli to maximum contraction is longer, and then from contraction to relaxation is also longer. Now the reason for this is these muscles of the calf have many, many more myofibrils present. So it takes longer for that calcium to, uh, to run its course, so to speak, or cause a contraction and relaxation. So this twitch idea is something we do in the laboratory. It's not really how our muscles work in the body because the nervous system doesn't ever just send one signal and that's it. You know, we, we can do this uh, with muscle cells in the lab to look at their differences, but what we see in um, uh, the body is we see multiple stimulations. Um, and we're going to encounter this again when we get to the, uh, the sensation chapter where we learn about the special senses. One of the ways the nervous system transmits information is by signal rate. So the faster a neuron fires, um, you know, that can mean uh, uh, the greater the stimuli, or it can mean the greater the intended effect, which is what we see in uh, muscle. Because it turns out that for every stimuli, in addition to that first one, you know, one stimuli creates a twitch. But let's say that before this relaxation phase occurs, we get another stimuli like right here. What we see happen is what's called wave summation. And what we see is that the muscle develops increasing amounts of tension depending on how rapidly the stimuli come. 
So the faster the brain stimulates a muscle, the greater the tension that muscle develops. And this kind of makes sense because with, with each subsequent stimulation, more calcium is released from that sarcoplasmic reticulum. So in, from resting to contracting, you know, some calcium comes out. But every time an action potential passes through those T tubules, more calcium is released. More calcium means more contracting uh, components. You know, more calcium means uh, there's more thin filaments that are participating in that muscle contraction. So the faster the stimulation, the greater the tension. Now, there's a limit. Once all of the uh, myosin and uh, actin molecules are all working at the same time, the muscle cannot develop any more tension. It's sort of out of hardware, so to speak. There, there's nothing else to add to what it's doing. And we call that tetanus, um, or a muscle that's in a maximal contraction state. In other words, it's contracting as hard as it can. It cannot do any more. And this is something that will happen if you stimulate a muscle too rapidly. Now, here again, the brain is smart enough to know not to do that. Um, but in certain uh, illnesses, like the illness that's called tetanus, what happens is muscles contract maximally because they're being falsely stimulated, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> but generally speaking, the, uh, the brain will send only enough signal to create the tension that it's after. All right, so that's a second way that the brain can control how much tension develops in a muscle. You know, the first has to do with muscle length. You know, the, the longer the muscle is stretched, the less effective it is at contracting. And then the second one, wave summation, is the faster the stimuli from the brain come, the more contraction you're going to get. And then the last way the brain controls tension is with this concept of motor units. Um, the, it turns out that the brain doesn't interact with muscles as a whole. You know, a muscle is an organ, it has a tendon at both ends, and then a belly in the middle. The brain doesn't just turn a muscle on or off. Instead, the motor neurons um, interact with fibers in that muscle. So not the muscle as a whole, but individual fibers inside that muscle. Um, and the, uh, the way this is done is different fibers are hooked up, so to speak, to different motor neurons. So a motor unit is all the skeletal muscle fibers in a muscle that are controlled by a single motor neuron. And what this represents is the, uh, the lowest level of control that the brain can exercise over that muscle. You know, um, the motor neurons are what trigger skeletal muscle fibers to contract. So um, the motor unit is all of the skeletal muscle fibers that are controlled by just one skeletal or by one motor neuron. So we can't activate a fewer number of muscle fibers than that. Because once that uh, motor neuron fires, it's going to activate all the muscle fibers that's attached to it. Um, now, muscles have thousands or even hundreds of thousands of individual fibers. There are many, many fewer motor neurons. So every motor neuron activates multiple skeletal muscle fibers. So it's, it's a one-to-many relationship. But in order for the muscle fibers to not get confused, they can't get more than one signal from more than one uh, motor neuron. So every motor neuron innervates multiple skeletal muscle fibers, but every skeletal muscle fiber is only innervated by one motor neuron. So it's sort of, uh, it's, it's a one-to-many relationship. So like if you have your, so here's your motor neuron. And it has connections to um, all different <clears throat> skeletal muscle fibers. So it's one to many. One motor neuron innervates many skeletal muscle fibers. But each one of these muscle fibers is only innervated by one motor neuron. In other words, this never happens. You know, if you had a second motor neuron, um, trying to innervate the same skeletal muscle fiber, you would create confusion. Because now, this essentially it has two, um, it has two masters, so to speak. You know, so 
This never happens in the body. Instead, we only see this. So this is a motor unit. All of the, um, the skeletal muscle fibers innervated by a single motor neuron. All right. Now, for uh, good reason, the um, uh, fibers that are innervated are not all in one place in a muscle. You know, if we put all of the skeletal muscle fibers innervated by one motor neuron in one, let's say, one side of the muscle, when that motor neuron uh, uh, activated, that muscle would have a tendency to curve because one side is contracting and the other side isn't. Instead, what we see is that the fibers are interspersed throughout the muscle. So like in this picture from your book, what you're seeing is like the blue um, fibers uh, are from one motor neuron, the purple another, and the orange from a third. And you can see that they're kind of all mixed up. You know, there's not a, an order. And it's that way on purpose so that that muscle, even if only one motor unit contracts, it still contracts in its normal straight fashion. So they're sort of uh, intermixed there. So what does the brain do with these motor units? Well, um, it can activate uh, none, some, or all of the motor units innervating a muscle, depending on how much uh, tension is needed. So if only a small amount of muscle force is required, then the brain is only going to activate one or, even, or um, a, a small number of motor units. If the muscle needs to contract a lot, you know, lifting something very heavy, for example, the brain is going to use all of the motor units that are available. So uh, as we increase the amount of force that that uh, muscle is going to make, the brain is going to add motor units all the time. So we call that recruitment or um, using additional motor units uh, to increase the amount of tension that's developed by that muscle. So just like frequency of stimulation is a way the brain can control how much tension a muscle makes, motor units are another way. If the brain needs to make a lot of force with that muscle, it's going to use a lot of motor units. If it only needs to make a little force, it's going to use many fewer motor units. <clears throat> so that's recruitment. And then another nice benefit of this motor unit setup is the different motor units can take turns. So let's say you're in a sustained contraction state. You know, somebody has given you something heavy and told you to just hold it. Well, eventually, you know, the, any one skeletal muscle fiber is going to get tired. But the reason you can hold something fairly lightweight for quite a while is because the motor units can alternate. So when one motor unit gets tired, uh, it uh, turns off and then another one takes its place so that it can rest. So it's sort of a a relay race of sorts. The different motor units can turn off, rest, and then come back to um, increase endurance. So that's another benefit of this motor unit system is taking turns. All right. So what we're seeing here is um, uh, here we have motor unit one and motor unit two are both active at the same time. So we can see that the tension in the muscle is like double of that. And then we can see that they're sort of taking turns to maintain that uh, tension at the top. All right. Um, another characteristic of motor units have to do with um, um, how finely the brain can control the muscle. The fewer the motor, uh, the fewer the muscle fibers in a motor unit, the the more control the brain has over these or over that muscle. So let's say this is a leg muscle. You know, we've got one motor neuron innervating a lot of muscle fibers. So we don't have a lot of fine control over those big muscles in our legs. Good for kicking, not good for painting, let's say. But in uh, places like the fingers and the eyes, we have many fewer uh, muscle fibers in each motor unit. So it gives the brain much finer control over what that muscle is doing. Because instead of adding, you know, in, in the leg, for example, if you go from one motor unit to two, you're adding a thousand muscle fibers, you know, because each skeletal or each motor neuron innervates a thousand muscle fibers. In the eye, if you add another motor unit, you're only adding like five. 
more muscle fiber. So the, the increments are much, much smaller, so the brain can control that <clears throat> muscle much more carefully. It tends to be that the larger the muscle, the more fibers there are in each motor unit, and therefore the less fine the control of, our, uh, of the brain over that muscle. So there's a, a trade-off of sorts. All right. Yes? What, motor units? Yeah, like, why can't they do that? Um, the, it is true that your, your, your um, motor neurons are not fully developed at birth. So you're born, they're there, but they're not developed yet. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So when your eye twitches, is that just um, one nerve, like, going crazy, or is that excessive? It's, it's either, it's, it can be a nerve, or it can just be the muscle that's twitching on its own. But, yeah, it's usually just one motor unit that's doing that. Yeah. All right. Which of the following help explain the increased uh, tension seen in multiple wave summation? So in that um, <coughs> st frequent stimulation. All right, jump in there, folks. All right, good. Most of you got that. That's B. Um, why does uh, the tension increase as we stimulate a muscle rapidly? Because with each action potential, more calcium is released from the SR. More calcium around the myofibrils means more actin and myosin filaments contracting or interacting. Um, so the answer there is B. Um, now, increased motor unit recruitment is a way that the brain increases the amount of tension that's being produced, but it doesn't have anything to do with uh, multiple wave summation or uh, uh, frequency of stimulation. All right. Okay. In order for muscle relaxation to occur, which of those things have to happen? All right, so in order for relaxation to happen, C, <clears throat> the active sites on actin have to be blocked again. Now, how does that happen? The um, sarcoplasmic reticulum has calcium pumps on it. So in the absence of stimulation from the nervous system, calcium is pumped in to the sarcoplasmic reticulum and therefore away from the myofibrils. When there's no calcium around, troponin returns to its original position and moves tropomyosin so that it covers those um, myosin binding sites, or those active sites, um, on actin. So yes, it's C, that they have to be covered for that muscle to relax. All right. Okay, so on to a little different topic. Still looking at the muscle as a whole, so the organ of the muscle, not just individual fibers. <clears throat> There are multiple different kinds of muscle contraction. The one that we think of most easily, you know, where a muscle uh, shortens, in other words, it reduces its length by pulling on something, 
That we call a concentric isotonic contraction. Um, so concentric just means that um, its uh, length is changing. Um, and isotonic, tonicity is um, tension. So the words are not really all that important, you know, what they mean here. But in a concentric isotonic reaction, a muscle contracts and shortens. So we can see that this weight that's attached to the muscle, if we stimulate this muscle in the right way, that weight will lift up off of the table because the muscle is, has gotten shorter. Um, so if we were to measure tension inside the muscle, we would get a pattern like this. So at first there's zero, that's this case, you know, where the weight is resting on the table. And tension starts to develop here, um, but until the muscle has developed enough tension to lift the weight, we don't actually see any change in length. So even though the muscle is contracting, see how this is going up, but this is staying flat? Um, what we're seeing there is the, the muscle has to generate enough force to actually lift the weight off the table. So that once it has uh, reached that, then it shortens. This is the, the length going down, but the tension no longer changes. Instead, the muscle is just shortening and pulling that weight up. Um, <clears throat> now, in general, the heavier the load, the longer it takes for the muscle to contract. And I think this is very intuitive because, you know, we use our muscles all the time. And we know that you can, you know, you can throw a penny a lot faster than you can throw a couch, right? <laughs> and the reason for that is the heavier the object, the longer it takes for the muscle to actually start moving it. You know, to move that couch, you have to recruit a whole bunch of motor units and a whole bunch of myofibrils to even start to move it. Whereas something light like a penny, you don't have to generate all that force to start the motion. You can just toss it very quickly. So um, the uh, heavier the load, the slower it contracts. Um, so it, uh, um, because of the amount of force that has to be overcome before you can change the length. All right. <clears throat> the other type of contraction, which is a little less intuitive, is called an eccentric isotonic contraction. Normally, when we think of muscles contracting, we think of, you know, flexion, um, you know, that a, a muscle is, is going to pull on a bone, a muscle is going to shorten. <clears throat> but say you have something heavy in your hands and you want to set it down on the floor gently. You know, you don't want to just drop it, but you want to set it down nice and slowly. What you need to have happen <clears throat> is you need to have the muscle lengthening because you are setting it down but it still has to hold the weight of the thing so you don't drop it and make a mess. So that's an eccentric isotonic contraction where the muscle is lengthening but supporting the weight of whatever is on the other end at the same time. <clears throat> so the example here is, you know, we've got a muscle strung up, um, weight is on the table. If we take the table away, the, um, the weight would drop, right? You know, if the muscle wasn't doing anything, but because this muscle is contracting, what we see is, uh, you know, here the support is removed um, and <clears throat> the, uh, the muscle develops tension to hold the weight and then slowly the length increases as the muscle puts that weight down. So in, a, in an eccentric contraction, the muscle is lengthening while it's supporting the load. So I think the best example of that is, you know, setting down something that's heavy. And then the, the last kind of contraction is called an isometric contraction. Iso is same, meter is length. So this is a muscle that is not changing its length, but is instead changing the tension that's present in it. The best example of this is, you know, some of yoga, where the exercise is all about staying still, right? But it's not easy because in order to stay in that position, the, the muscle has to stay contracted. It has to continue to generate tension so that its length doesn't change. So here what we see is the length doesn't change, but the tension goes up as um, that weight is supported even without um, motion. So that's an isometric uh, contraction. A lot of exercise uh, routines are very isometric focused um, because it, it, it has been shown that isometrics help to tone muscle, 
without necessarily changing their bulk. So they don't get bigger, they don't get smaller, they just get better. All right. So we'll talk a little bit about muscles and, and the fuel that they use. Um, muscle contraction is hugely expensive. In other words, uh, muscles blow through ATP like nothing else in the body. Um, they uh, are a primary um, you know, user of, of all the energy that you take in in uh, food. A good chunk of that is going to go to the use of muscles. So muscle uh, contraction is expensive. Because of that, muscle has some special specializations um, for uh, ATP management, essentially. One is this protein, it's called creatine, um, which they sell in the, uh, you know, in the uh, GNC or their, uh, what do they call those, supplements. And they probably shouldn't because it doesn't do what people think. But um, what creatine does is it acts as a kind of um, storage, it acts as a kind of battery for ATP. So we know that ATP becomes ADP plus P when energy is used, right? Well, what creatine does is in its storage form, it sits there like this. So it's called it's creatine phosphate. Um, so we, the muscle has a bunch of this creatine, and when it's at rest, it adds phosphates to all these creatines. So that when the muscle is actively contracting, ATP becomes ADP, and then this phosphate can go back onto the ADP and essentially create an ATP without having to go through any of that complex chemistry that goes out of the mitochondria. So the muscle forms creatine phosphate, and then when it starts to run out of ATP, it uses that phosphate to attach to ADP, making an ATP again. So it serves as a kind of ATP battery. <clears throat> um, another special specialization is myoglobin. Um, myoglobin is a protein very similar to hemoglobin, uh, and it stores oxygen. Because muscles need a lot of oxygen to um, uh, continue aerobic metabolism, they actually store some oxygen inside themselves. So one of the reasons that muscle is red um, is this myoglobin that's holding oxygen on the inside of the muscle. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, okay, so myoglobin, creatine. Um, <clears throat> another specialization is that muscles can use multiple different fuels. Unlike the brain that can only use glucose, muscles can use fatty acids, they can use... Um, glucose, and they can use glycogen um, all, uh, you know, very easily. <clears throat> now, which fuel a muscle uses depends on how that muscle is, um, is being used, as we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and because uh, glucose is always a good source of ATP, the um, muscle actually stores a lot of glucose inside itself, again, as glycogen. You know, so early on in the course, we talked about glycogen as long chains of glucose, right? We have, there's two places in the body you find glycogen. One is in the liver, and that's the body's <coughs> storage for glucose. And then the other place you find it is in muscle. And in muscle, muscle's very, always very selfish. You know, it doesn't share its glycogen with the body. It stores glycogen just for itself so that it will have glucose around uh, when it's needed. So... Um, in a, any given muscle, we, there's enough ATP around um, to create about two seconds of contraction. Um, if you add to it that creatine phosphate system, we can go from two seconds to 15 seconds. And then if you include um, all the glucose stored as glycogen, now that muscle can sustain contraction for about 130 seconds in, in anaerobically, in other words, without involving the mitochondria at all. Now, if we go to uh, the aerobic um, uh, metabolism, I can't see it on my screen here, but I think it's 240 seconds or, or 2,200 seconds. Um, so these are ways for the, the muscle to continue to contract um, without having to generate new ATP to do so. All right. But, of course, at some point that is going to run out. You know, the, the energy stores are going to run out. 
the ATP is going to be gone. All the creatine phosphate will just be creatine, so it's burned out. You know, the battery's dead. The glycogen is running out, so what does the muscle do? Well, it depends on um, the, how the muscle is being used. So in the resting muscle, um, you know, it still has to keep itself alive. Now, certainly, it, it's not using a lot of ATP like it will be when it's contracting. But the fuel that uh, muscle prefers to use is actually fatty acids. So um, uh, you may have heard that the, the greater your muscle mass, the more fat you burn every day, even without exercise. This is the reason for that. Skeletal muscle prefers to use fatty acid as its fuel. So the more skeletal muscle tissue you have, the more fatty acids that are going to be burned every day, even just sitting there on the couch, at least until the muscle starts to atrophy. Um, so in the resting muscle, fatty acids are, are funneled into the mitochondria along with oxygen, and ATP comes out and CO2 comes out. Now some of that ATP is going to be used to recharge the creatine battery. So the creatine is going to be made into creatine phosphate, that ADP, you know, or that ATP becomes an ADP, and then eventually that ADP will be transformed again to ATP of the mitochondria with fatty acids. And then in addition, in the resting muscle, um, glucose is taken in, but it's not used to create ATP. Instead, it's just stored up as glycogen. And that's because um, the, the muscle can use glucose in a pinch when there's no oxygen around to continue to contract in that anaerobic way. All right, so that's at rest. In moderate activity, um, this is uh, a level of skeletal muscle activity where the amount of oxygen being delivered by the cardiovascular system is enough for the mitochondria to continue to produce ATP from fatty acids. So um, here again, in many exercise regimens, you know, cardio uh, regimens, they want you to, uh, to not be working at your maximum. They want you to be working sort of somewhere in your middle. And the reason for that is as long as that muscle activity is low enough that oxygen delivery can keep up, then all you're burning is fatty acids. So fatty acids come in along with oxygen, ATP is produced, um, and CO2 is released. Now, in addition to the fatty acids coming in from the outside, the muscle is also going to use its glucose stores, its glycogen stores, to create ATP as well. But um, it's going in through the uh, mitochondria um, so because there's oxygen around. So both this glucose and the fatty acids are being uh, uh, aerobically utilized. So that's moderate activity. It's at peak activity that things get different. Now, this is anaerobic metabolism. And I know all of you have heard about this in health class and gym class and all that. Um, but this is aerobic exercise, what's going on in the muscle. And this is anaerobic exercise or the anaerobic state. So here, the root problem is that oxygen delivery cannot keep up with the metabolic demands of the muscle. In other words, the muscle is blowing through ATP faster than there is enough oxygen coming in from the cardiovascular system. So we have to get into some other pathways without oxygen. Um, so the glycogen is broken down into glucose, and then glucose is broken down into pyruvic acid. This process, which is called glycolysis, actually produces ATP without the need for oxygen. So you see that there's no oxygen you know, in any of these equations. But you'll also see that the ATP numbers are much, much smaller than these 34s that you see down here in aerobic metabolism. So anaerobic metabolism is sort of quick and dirty, but it's not very efficient. Um, the other problem is this pyruvic acid um, becomes lactic acid, and lactic acid affects the pH inside the muscle cell, um, as many of you will have heard before. Um, so that's the glycolysis pathway. And then the other pathway in anaerobic metabolism is this creatine phosphate. Again, the creatine phosphate is used to change ADP back to ATP by uh, it giving up its phosphate, you know, at least until it runs out after that minute and a half or whatever. All right. Um, and then these ATPs that are formed are going to uh, continue to support um, uh, the contraction of the muscle.
All right. So one of the reasons that this peak level of activity isn't, we can't sustain it for very long, is the glycogen runs out, so there's no glucose to break down um, into pyruvic acid. The creatine phosphate runs out, and the lactic acid builds up. And all three of those things um, affect muscle performance. And eventually, what we'll see is that the muscle uh, fatigues. All right. <clears throat> so looking at that same thing in a different way, you know, when there's plenty of oxygen available, we're in this uh, aerobic metabolism state where glucose as well as fatty acids um, are being shunted through the mitochondria to create ATP. But when there's not sufficient oxygen around, all the, the body can do is uh, the first step, the glycolysis step, that produces um, pyruvate, which eventually becomes lactate, uh, which builds up. So as long as um, the uh, level of muscle activity is kept in balance with oxygen delivery, then muscle contraction can go on you know, indefinitely like you see in like a marathon or an ultra marathon. All right. So why, why exactly do muscles give out? You know, why can we, uh, you know, are we forced to stop running, you know, sprinting, for example? Um, well, it's a couple of things. Depletion of energy reserves, that's glycogen and uh, creatine phosphate. The drop in pH from the lactic acid that's building up. And then eventually, there actually gets to be cellular damage. Um, you know, if as the pH drops and, and uh, muscle contraction continues, the myofibrils and their filaments actually start to get torn up. So that's another reason that uh, fatigue eventually um, uh, occurs. Usually, um, a muscle can recover from these things um, uh, very easily. Okay, I missed something. Hold on. Uh, all right. So, in, in, in the anaerobic state, huge amounts of lactic acid or lactate are formed. Um, now, after that anaerobic burst of, of exercise, the body has all this lactate that it has to deal with. Now, one of the ways it can do, deal with that is when there's oxygen around again, lactate can actually be pushed backwards in this cycle. So lactate can be made into pyruvate. Pyruvate can be made into glucose, which can be made into glycogen. So that's one way we get rid of lactate when there's oxygen around, is we reform it into glucose. Another thing we can do with lactate is make it pyruvate and then feed it to the mitochondria, and it'll make ATP out of it, um, producing CO2. But in the body as a whole, there is this cycle called the Cori cycle that allows the liver to help the muscles get rid of all the lactate that they've made. You know, skeletal muscle is highly specialized for contraction. The liver is highly specialized for metabolism or for doing chemistry, basically. So the two work together in this process called the Cori cycle. So when there is uh, anaerobic um, metabolism going on, so peak exercise performance, so to speak, uh, glucose is broken down to pyruvate, which becomes lactate, and that lactate builds up. Once that peak exercise is over, <clears throat> um, we have to get rid of that lactate that was built up. So the lactate leaves the skeletal muscle, it comes to the liver, and then in the liver, we have both of those pathways that we just looked at. The pyruvate is made back into glucose. This takes ATP, though, so it's, it, we have to put energy in to turn pyruvate back into glucose. That glucose, then, um, is released by the liver, reabsorbed by the muscle, and then the muscle reforms it into glycogen. So we have, first it got used, and then it got remade, then it got shuttled back and uh, put back as glycogen. And then uh, the other part of the Cori cycle is to break down that pyruvate from the lactate um, using the mitochondria like we just talked about. So the Cori cycle is the liver and the skeletal muscle working together to get rid of the lactate and to uh, uh, replace the glucose that was used in that anaerobic metabolism. So, Cori cycle. All right. So, all of us have uh, exercised, and, and when you stop exercising, you continue to breathe heavier for a period of time after that. And the reason for that is 
exercise creates an oxygen debt. So the reason you continue to, um, uh, in, uh, to breathe deeper and faster for a time is um, you have to recover that oxygen. So where's that oxygen going? Some of it's going into the muscle's myoglobin. Um, you know, it has to get refilled because in uh, uh, exercise it, it gets depleted. So some of that oxygen you're bringing in is going there. It takes um, ATP to create glycogen. And in order to create ATP efficiently, we need to have oxygen. So that's another place that the oxygen uh, debt exists. Turning that lactic acid back into pyruvate also requires ATP, oxygen there again. And then one that you might, uh, that's a little different, is um, restoring body temperature. When muscle contracts, it generates heat, lots of it. So one of the things that the body has to deal with in exercise is heat management. It has to get rid of that heat that all of those um, chemical reactions that are causing muscle to contract are generating. So one of the ways that we cool ourselves is by increasing our respiratory rate and depth. The, and, and we use, and often we'll go from breathing through our noses to breathing through our mouths. And there's a reason for that. The deeper and faster you breathe, the more evaporation occurs out of your lungs. And with every bit of evaporation goes a bit of heat. So um, the reason like your dog uh, uh, pants is they're doing the same thing. By increasing the amount of air going in and out of their lungs, they're basically turning their lungs into a swamp cooler. So water is evaporating, and that's cooling the animal's core body temperature. We do the same thing. Now, we have another trick, too, which is we can sweat. So we put a little bit of fluid on our skin. That fluid evaporates and takes heat away with it, and that helps us to maintain our body temperature, too. But in, the, in this oxygen debt or recovery period, that's one of the things we're doing is we're still blowing off heat from the uh, activity of those skeletal muscles. All right. So there are more than one different kinds of uh, muscle. And you can make a note on your notes here, do not memorize. Because while every anatomy and physiology textbook presents this idea, it does not come up in real clinical life at all. So um, the short version is not all muscle fibers are the same. In a uh, individual muscle, um, you can have more than one kind of muscle fiber. Um, uh, although usually um, there's a tendency or a predominance of one fiber type over the other. But essentially, it, the, uh, the difference here is that a, a muscle fiber that can uh, contract very rapidly with a lot of force has, um, is larger but has less endurance than a muscle fiber that contracts much more slowly and with less force but can do it for much longer. It's sort of intuitive. You know, if you're going to do a lot of work real fast, you're not going to be able to do a lot of it, right? But if you're going to do a little bit of work slowly over time, you can do that for a long time. So the slow fibers um, are small, slow, but very fatigue resistant. So they can. Um, so we see these in like the muscles of the back, you know, that are holding us up all the time. They don't ever get a break, you know, until we lay down at the end of the day in a bed, they're working all day long. So we see these slow fibers with their high fatigue resistance. Whereas in the uh, cap, for example, you know, you, you, can, you can jump straight up in the air because these fibers can put a lot of force in play very quickly, but they can't do it for very long. So they're evolved to be fast and strong, but they have a very low fatigue resistance. So they get tired very quickly. And then the intermediate fibers are sort of in between. Um, so we have the three different fiber types. And then uh, just a few, let's see, clinical correlations, let's see. All right, so this guy clearly has some hypertrophy of muscle going on. The way that happens is, when a muscle is challenged, in other words, when it is um, uh, uh, pushed to uh, uh, do more contraction against more weight, one of its long-term responses is to create more muscle fibers, or not muscle fibers, but more myofibrils, so more muscle proteins. 
So the reason that a bodybuilder's muscles get bigger is because each fiber in that muscle has gotten bigger because it has developed more and more myofibrils. More myofibrils means more strength because there are more actin myosin heads interacting. So there's you know more and more uh, force can be generated. <clears throat> Uh, if you don't use a muscle, um, the body does the opposite. You know, if you use a muscle, it builds it up. If you don't use it, it starts to take it apart. Um, so in somebody in a wheelchair, for example, what you'll see in their legs is that they get very, very thin. Their legs get very, very thin. The reason for that is muscle atrophy. If the muscles are not used, are not challenged, then the proteins that make them up start to be recycled. You know, the body is not going to continue to, to uh, have a thing that's not being used, you know, so it's, they go away. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of um, conditions that affect the neuromuscular junction. So, you know, here's the motor neuron, right, um, and here's that synapse. Well, botulism um, and myasthenia gravis both affect that, that spot where the uh, motor neuron connects with the skeletal muscle. So like in myasthenia gravis, um, those acetylcholine receptors on the muscle cell membrane are actually destroyed. So the muscle can't contract because it can't generate an action potential to do so. So you get a progressive paralysis. Now most people recover from myasthenia gravis because those receptors can be replaced. Um, similarly, uh, Botulism, or the botulinum toxin, also called Botox by the plastic surgeons, um, what they do is they prevent acetylcholine from being released from that um, motor neuron. So if the motor neuron can't release acetylcholine, it can't trigger muscle contraction. So it's a paralyzing agent. Um, Botox, botulinum toxin, which are the same thing, it prevents muscles from contracting by blocking the release of acetylcholine at that neuromuscular junction. Now, why does that make your wrinkles go away? Because wrinkles are usually caused by muscle contracting. So the trade-off is um, people who get lots of Botox, they can't move the muscles of their face, but they don't have any wrinkles either. So it's a trade-off. Um, another one, uh, polio affects uh, motor neurons. Um, so it causes paralysis by uh, rendering the, the nervous system component of motion um, inept, so it, it can't do its thing. Um, and then, let's see, uh, and then the last one, rigor mortis, which is the stiffening that occurs after death. The reason that happens is um, after, as the muscle cells start to die, all that calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum ends up getting released. And uh, so, the troponin moves away, or the troponin moves the trophomycin away, and the muscle, even though you're dead, the muscle is contracting, and it will continue to do so. Those myosin uh, actin interactions will keep happening until there's no ATP left. So what happens in a person, you know, who's been dead for several hours is all their muscles are contracted, um, and they stay that way until the ATP either runs out or until those cross bridges start to decompose. So, rigor mortis. All right, we'll call it a day right there because I can tell that it's uh, time for break, right?